Thank you so much, uh, Marta. It's really a pleasure. It's really an honor to actually share the stage with two women, um, Mrs. Lari and, and Dr. Gutman, who are in my eyes, uh, the epitome of professionalism and embody the best of architectural practice, of education and research. So thank you, Marta, your leadership at Spitzer has already started showing great fruit, um, and including this wonderful lecture uh, series. Thank you for getting us going with it. Um, Mrs. Lari actually needs very little introduction, but here it is. Um, and since it's very long, I'm going to read it very quickly because I know we have been waiting to, <laughs> to hear from her. Um, she's among the most well-known and well-respected architects in Pakistan and among the most successful women architects anywhere in the world. Um, she's also an architectural historian, heritage conservationist, a philanthropist, and a humanitarian. She's the co-founder and CEO of the Heritage Foundation of Pakistan and the founder chair of Inspao Pakistan. She graduated from the Oxford School of Architecture, which is now known as the Oxford Brooks University in the United Kingdom, and was elected to the Royal Institute of British Architects in 1969. She was elected president of the Institute of Architects in Pakistan in 1978, and was the first chairperson of the Pakistan Council for Architects and Town Planners in 1983. During her architectural practice of over 36 years, she has built several landmark buildings in Pakistan, um, such as the Finance and Trade Center, Pakistan State Oil Office, the ABN AMRO Bank, etc. And she's also authored several books um, whose subjects range from traditional housing um, and monumental architecture in Sindh to colonial buildings of the British Raj in the city of Karachi. So actually, for those of you who are based in New York, I hope you will go and visit the new show at MoMA at the Museum of Modern Art, um, which is titled Architecture of Decolonization in South Asia from 1947 to 1987. And Mrs. Lai is her work is there amongst other great luminaries. Um, so we're very proud of her. Um, for myself, as somebody who grew up in Pakistan and in Karachi, she's someone who I've looked up to um, and who has really forged the path, not just for myself, but for many young architects, especially women. Um, I think it's very important to recognize her service. In fact, I'm not the only one who says this. Uh, the heritage, uh, you know, that she has helped preserve and her humanitarian work um, earned her uh, the highest national distinctions in Pakistan, the Sitara Imtiaz, as well as the Hilale Imtiaz in 2014 and 20, 2006. In 2016, she received the highly acclaimed Fukuoka Prize for Asian Art and Culture from Japan. And in 2020, she received the Jane Drew Prize for her contribution to raising the profile of women in architecture and in design. Um, in October 2021, just last fall, she was declared the architect for the poorest of the poor and was awarded an honorary degree an honorarium in architecture from the Polytech, excuse me, Politecnico di Milano, being the first woman to be honored in 158 years of the university's history. In the past 20 years, her practice has moved from commissions to architecture of care, um, in which she has truly uh, turned her attention to designing for the poor, for communities at risk, and for those affected by environmental disasters. I think her work speaks to the urgency and importance of rethinking what we build, how we build it, and who we build it for. I hope the students in the audience will pay close attention, um, as I think we have a great deal to learn from her work and her and her and what she has done in terms of social and ecological justice. I think she speaks to the future, um, as do all of you. Um, since 2005, she's devised various programs based on women-centered zero carbon footprint structures and sustainable building techniques, resulting in 43,000 green shelters using bamboo, lime, and mud, placing Pakistan in the lead as the largest zero carbon shelter program in the world. Again, I hope we're all paying attention. She's devised barefoot social architecture to foster self-reliance through disaster resilient, zero carbon, sustainable, low tech architecture that enables marginalized sections, particularly women to retain their rights 
dignity, and pride. We're really honored to have you here, Mrs. Lari, um, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, greetings from Pakistan, everybody. And, uh, you know, it's uh, just wonderful to see that there is this audience, although maybe not so much, but virtual audience is there. So that's great, although, although we are recording. So thank you so much, uh, Dean Professor Dr. Marta Gutman, for your invitation to present my thoughts on the need for changing the direction of architecture. I would like to take this opportunity to compliment you on your great work that focuses on women and children. I think it's amazing that you focus on that, and it's so wonderful to see that. And then thank you for your generous introduction, <laughs> Ishwar, my Pakistan's own distinguished, distinguished historian, Dr. Kishore Rizvi, who I'm proud to have known since she was a schoolgirl, such a long time ago. <laughs> And I'm so sorry, you know, when you get to my age, then the baggage is so much that you have to be patient. So I think the moral is don't listen to people who are very old. But so they are, okay. <laughs> so um, I feel that although far away, but I'm among those who carry the same humanistic values and concern for neglected sections of society as our two earlier speakers. And what an honor to deliver the Lewis Mumford Lecture at your fine university, Bernard and Anne Spitzer School of Architecture. Mumford was well known as a humanist and spoke freely about social injustices in society. I'm sure if he was alive today, he would have been equally vociferous about ecological injustices uh, in the world beset with disruptions due to climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. He was fully cognizant of increasingly dehumanized urban environment in the US and wrote extensively against those who wish to give preference to cars and machines over human beings. I think we should remember that because there's too much of this where we are really now deferring to um, machines too much. So we certainly need that voice today. And also of another giant, social activist Jane Jacobs, whose impactful death in life of great American cities and uh, terms like eyes on the street left an indelible mark on some of us. These two are major factors who influenced my generation. I'm grateful to them both for creating the consciousness to give precedence to human beings and social capital over cars and urban expressways. It took a long time for me to become an architectural activist and emboldened enough to raise my voice against social injustices in the global South and also ecological injustices prevalent in the global North. The question that has troubled me for the longest time and that I have raised in numerous gatherings of architects and university students, such as yourselves, and just last month in the UK at Assemblies of Royal Institute of British Architects in London and at the Oxford Human Rights Festival, the question is, uh, should architects continue to be an instrument in the hands of the 1% who economist Thomas Piketty says have accumulated the most wealth? And must we aspire only to become prima donnas creating star architects for the select few, however much damage it may cause to the earth. And that too in a world where one in eight persons goes to bed hungry every night. As I've said in my manifesto published last year in London's Dazine magazine, today we live in an era that is beset with fragmentation and disruptions. We must remember that it's a new world altogether. We, at least I had never thought about. It is a world ravaged by rising poverty levels and increasing disparities, depletion of the earth's resources and climate change, along with COVID-19 imperatives, all requiring innovative design solutions. In a new world order, how can we continue to design for the privileged 1% just because they have acquired the most wealth? Under such challenging circumstances, when many countries in the world will be unable to meet United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, it is the power of design that is in demand for serving the majority, because it is not only the privileged who have a right to enjoy well-designed environments. I put it to you that those that live on the margins need more, not less design, to achieve a better quality of life. My question to you is, why can't we have architects acting as social entrepreneurs or ecological entrepreneurs? Must we continue as in the past, waiting for the summons of the wealthy? or to receive commissions from the likes of the sophisticated Medici's of Florence, the unscrupulous robber barons of East India Company, the eco-indulgent merchant princes of industrial revolution, and the present day's exploitative multinationals that promote high carbon lifestyles. We are all aware of the damage caused by the colonial mindset to the Earth's ecosystem due to wasteful and highly consumptive ways of living and building. 
in view of greater understanding developed due to widespread undertakings which originated in your country, actually, the Me Too and Black Lives Matter movements, when I'm sure many of you in New York and other cities also valiantly battled for, I'm sure you, you joined those marches that happened at the time. Let us begin to give credence to women's voices now and those that live on the margins. And let us go back to reading Louis Mumford and Jane Jacobs, because the fault lines are now clear and the wasteful high-tech urban design and architectural solutions adopted by industrialized societies that give preference to high carbon enterprises rather than human beings and human values. And the unfortunate thing is that we in the global South follow those examples, which probably we should totally ignore now. If we wish to reverse the tide and save the planet from further misuse, I suggest that we need to seek low tech, low impact solutions found in countries in the global south, such as Pakistan, countries which have rich traditions of tangible and intangible heritage that will lead to fashioning an equitable world based on local wisdoms and vernacular techniques. So today, as architect for the poorest of the poor, I would like to share with you my journey in the pursuit of social and ecological justice for the majority, which includes learning from tradition and heritage to serve the marginalized. And also, in deference to Mumford, to present an example of humanizing a section of the highly degraded environment of my own city, Karachi. So um, i just like to start my slides. Now. Just bear with me for a moment until I manage to do that. Um, so All right, so a little bit about my, my own uh, organization. Um, this is, it's a not-for-profit social and cultural entrepreneur organization established for safeguarding Pakistan's cultural heritage. Since 2005, it provides humanitarian assistance by linking heritage for innovative socially and ecologically led initiatives. Uh, and here you can see uh, on the left is the monument that we conserved in um, the 16th century monument at the Makli World Heritage Site. And on the right, you see the little, uh, mud earth houses that were built by people themselves after great floods in Pakistan. And then just to come to my uh, heritage in Pakistan, I thought I'd just very quickly go through it. Uh, we have this tangible heritage um, because I, I draw sustenance from heritage and cultural traditions, which ranges from a rich collection of tangible heritage beginning from Bronze Age Mohenjo-Daro to 19th and 20th century British colonial period. There are so many different phases in between and so many different dynasties and different cultural themes that appear uh, in, 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 in our, in our uh, you know, architecture and cultural heritage. And they all lend a diversity to our cultural legacy that is not found in many countries uh, because it's just each one is so different from each other. Intangible heritage in my country, which you see in the middle, uh, uh, is all pervading with many rituals and crafts being practiced to, practiced to this day, propagating a culture of equality and humanism without distinction of color or creed. And then the vernacular heritage, and here it is, on the, as you see, um, which is from where I have learned the use of sustainable materials, local sourcing, ease of handling, economy in use, and one that is based on local wisdoms. Here are some of the age old methodologies that we have inherited in my country. So I want to show you some slides which will show you what we've got actually here and which we need to study even in greater depth. This is a book on the left, you see the, the, the traditional architecture of Tata. Uh, it's based on the documentation we carried out in 1979, such a long time ago, when I wrote about the historic town of Tata with its distinctive wind catchers and beautiful lime stabilized mud plastered walls. It's just amazing, the, the walls are so beautiful. And then this is a sketch that shows, uh, which is a wind scoop, and it shows how prevailing wind is drawn inside the house, providing natural cooling throughout the house. And there's a, the next one that I want to show you is uh, zero energy for improved microclimate. And on the left is this uh, a view of uh, uh, this remarkable mansion in Peshawar's wall city, which I, I was able to conserve. The courtyard configuration creates its own microclimate within buildings without re relying on any mechanical means. At night, cool air stored in the atrium keeps the surrounding rooms cool during, during much of the day. So these are the elements that we can use even today in all our, our constructions. And then this is uh, zero energy water cooling. Uh, in the early 2000s, UNESCO appointed me national advisor for conservation of world heritage Lahore Fort. And you can see, uh, especially here, um, that this is, you know, it's, it's a, uh, there are water fountains and introverted atriums that cool the surrounding structures along with this natural water uh, cooling me mechanisms in the 17th century Mughal Lahore, the paradisal Shalimar Gardens. So it is from methodologies such as these that offer solutions for creating buildings of great comfort, utilizing natural 
peak renewable energy and belonging to the third world during 36 years of private practice, barring a few projects for social housing and then Kishwar mentioned, which is being displayed at MoMA currently, earth buildings and work in informal settlements. I also had indulged in an extravagant ecotistic journey, which focused on serving the elite of my country. And for the longest time I did that, huh? which as a head office of uh, this, you can see is the head office of Pakistan State Oil Building at the time of Fortune 500 listed companies. So I could have gone along my career as a star architect, I suppose, as we know, there's a great deal of comfort in continuing to pursue well-trodden avenues. But I can tell you from my own experience, nothing could be more enriching than the exploration of an unpaved vagabond pathway. Bringing to a close my architectural career was the best decision I could have taken, I believe. From 2005, recurring disasters in Pakistan forced my attention towards the vast marginalized section of my country. I hadn't known about it. I hadn't thought about it before that. And so let's just look at that, um, the kind of threats that they are to, our, to the Earth's ecosystem. So as a result of the understanding that I developed regarding the challenges to the Earth's ecosystem by the way I designed, it was the interaction with poverty stricken and vulnerable populations that forced me to dispense with my largely inflated ego and to begin exploring their age old practices. Now learning from Pakistan's pre-industrial vernacular heritage, I understood that design is not a standalone activity. It must be underpinned by consideration of social impact and ecological sustainability. As I move forward on a divergent path from practicing or practicing architecture from the one which I was trained for, the question of a most in my mind is, how can architects play a role in mending the imbalances by stretching this highly damaged earth tapestry? Because it is damaged and because we keep on inflicting more damage to it. The question is whether architects will consider minimizing the use of highly energy consumptive cement and steel by creating hybrid structures a combination of high carbon skeletons and uh, low carbon infill and finishes, perhaps incorporating my favorite zero carbon materials, lime instead of cement, bamboo rather than wood, and lime stabilized earth and aggregate that will make cement concrete redundant. Will you, for instance, all of you who are there, will you consider following movements based on transition design, degrowth and circular economy to limit consumption levels in the global north. I mean, these are movements that are already there and they are spreading. And then in the global south, uh, you know, adopt my barefoot social architecture of Baza to reach out to the marginalized, creating alternative design conceptions to fashion sustainable and equitable lifestyles for those who we serve. Because architects have got to look at those people that we are currently keeping out of bounds, so to speak. So, um, Barefoot and Muckley. Because of widespread deficits and deprivations, particularly among women, for me, the pursuit for justice has been paramount. And the reason why I decided to design Baza for the disadvantaged, I felt empathy with those who walked barefoot and had become my fellow travelers, because I'm with them now most of the time. Walking barefoot demonstrates the hard, harshness and hardness of life, but it has its benefits. You are able to tread softly on earth and grow up using planet's resources judiciously. You really feel that you have to do with whatever little you have, and that, that really teaches you a lot. So, um, so what is Baza? Some of you may have heard of it. Baza is akin to social engineering for bringing about social change, incorporating environmental, cultural, and technical dimensions, resulting in transformation of mindset from a cycle of dependency to a culture of pride and self-reliance. On the one hand, Baza seeks to democratize architecture that provides people with well-being and self-esteem. On the other, it unashamedly promotes zero carbon footprint structures. Using ubiquitous earth, conservative ma magic lime and renewable bamboo. For myself, while working with marginalized communities, I've stumbled upon numerous uh, design opportunities unclaimed before in the pursuit of fulfilling the exigencies of social and ecological well-being. So, um, I thought I'd just show you this slide which shows the impact of Baza and the benefits accrued through, uh, through this implementation. We were able to provide assistance to about 0.84 million people in seven years in over 100,000 uh, or 100,000 uh, persons per year. Through our zero carbon rights-based development, it aims to achieve 12 out of 17 sustainable development goals or SDGs at an extremely low cost. So those who are familiar with my work, um, know that Baza relies on four tenets. 
First, maximizing the potential of existing barefoot ecosystem and applying three zeros, zero cost to donor, zero carbon, zero waste methodologies leading to zero poverty, which as you might know is SDG number one. And then focus on social and ecological justice through humanistic architecture, fostering pride, dignity, and well-being, and preventing depletion of the planet's resources. Thirdly, delivery of unmet needs. And you must remember for the poor, there are so many, so many uh, needs that they have, but they're never met because everything is far too expensive for them. And we need to have this kind of barefoot entrepreneurs that we have created or bees with particular focus on women uh, through this barefoot incubator for social good and environmental sustainability for training and affordable products for BOP, which is bottom of the pyramid. And then fourthly, low tech, low impact, non-engineered structures for shrinking the ecological footprint uh, in construction using green skills and sustainable locally sourced materials. So let's look at now uh, Tenant number one, which is maximizing the barefoot ecosystem. Now, among the reasons for BASA outreach have been the maximization of the barefoot ecosystem, which is vast. In many countries, it would be over 80% of the population. So it's a vast number of people that are there that could be served. And so this is a, a graphics to show what is a what is this barefoot ecosystem. Uh, it has a barefoot economy, as you'll see. Then there is a barefoot market. There's a also barefoot enterprises, there's uh, barefoot entrepreneurs, the barefoot skills and the barefoot products. And the key is that the, the people who are trained, they really cater to the other poor, not necessarily to the rich, not to the urbanites, not to foreign uh, countries, but they're within themselves, which is 80% of the population. And here, in order to create zero carbon uh, humanistic architecture, I follow two gurus. There's Hassan Fatehi, the earth guru, author of Architecture for the Poor, who taught me the value of engaging them to unleash their creativity. And uh, Dean Mata tells me that uh, you are uh, carry, you're carrying out some research on him and what a great visionary he was. I think we need to really study him more as to how he did it almost a century ago, what we are thinking about now. And then uh, the second rule that I have is ancient Roman, uh, Marcus Vitruvius, that you must have read and know about, who must have, you know, in, in, that, in that way that, you know, you have probably read his, uh, you know, his seven books or 10 books of architecture and so on. So from him, I have learned the use of lime and the importance of air, water, earth, and fire, four elements, the alchemy of which leads us to democratic norms and behavior. And then uh, and this is my palette, uh, which I'd like to introduce these three materials uh, that I've used in my humanitarian architecture to achieve a carbon, achieve carbon neutral structures. In this slide, you can see the attributes of each material. And uh, just to sort of you know explain a little bit more, earth, um, a combination of unfired clay, rich earth and straw provides passive environmental control, buffers relative humidity. And this has become something very important in post COVID uh, scenario, because if you don't have proper humidity levels, then your, your, your recovery is delayed considerably. So we have to be looking at these things. And it, it creates non-toxic, healthy internal environment. Its waste becomes a resource and it minimizes stress on heating or cooling systems. It is a miracle material with zero embodied energy and zero echo footprint. So, uh, and then you have the, the second one, which is the low energy lime, uh, which through the alchemy of a fire transforms a lump of stone into an unparalleled force that has provided strength to Bronze Age Egyptian pyramids, the first century BC Roman aqueducts and the impregnable 15th century Timurid forts. And once the common earth and lime are mixed together, water provides a strength that cannot be surpassed by any other material and the least by Portland cement. And you have to try it to really believe it. And then third material, of course, is bamboo, uh, that environmentalist love, uh, that is the largest renewable resource in the world today, which due to its resilience and ease of use is the mainstay of my non-engineered seismic and flood resistant structures. Technically classified a grass if it yields a new crop every two and three or three years. So there's no need anymore to use any wood. Coincidentally, the use of such materials is the route to zero or low ecological footprint. Now we come to tenet number two, which is focused on social and ecological justice through humanistic architecture. And here I thought, uh, you know, that I, I could show you uh, how I'm learning from traditional building techniques. So here's an example of uh, what happened after the floods when we did the study. You see this thatch roof and this building survived. And uh, basically, as you can see, it's nothing but mud walls and thatch roofs. And, uh, and basically what I have done is to learn from that. And my walls are lime stabilized and uh, 
but materials are all locally sourced. We have the thatched roof in which you get beautiful ventilation and the whole structure is extremely cool, um, you know, during, during summers particularly. And this is the desert roof that we are using, uh, which is amazing. So, and it's very easy to construct. And then this is the second one that I wanted to show you, which is the cross bracing uh, in the north of Pakistan. Uh, and actually it is in wood and my innovation is to use the same cross bracing, but it is replaced now in with bamboo to create strong and resilient structures. This is the basis of the log that I'll show you later or Lari Octagreen structural wall panel that is finding universal application now. And then I just wanted to show you very quickly this women's center and there's a, I'll see if this, uh, if I can make this run, this is a, an Al Jazeera uh, animation. And the whole idea was it's all bamboo, as you can see completely. And uh, you can see when the waters rise, because it's an area where we, every year they get flooding and uh, it survives. And so this is what you need to do is to provide um, refuge to people during, during floods. So now we come to tenant number three, which is delivery of unmet needs. And that's where, uh, you know, we have sustainable locally sourced materials and also provide training through our uh, particular kind of incubator that we have developed. So uh, let's just see what are the unmet needs of the poor. And for instance, I'm sorry, they're still pounds. I meant to change them to dollars, but I've obviously forgot. But they're very inexpensive structures. They're made out of bamboo, bamboo prefab panels that are plastered with the lime and, and mud and matting and so on, and extremely inexpensive, uh, totally zero waste and, and you know, structures. Uh, these are important because unless you have at least a, a shelter and have at least a toilet, a sanitation, you cannot survive. The third important element for me is always the stove. Uh, as you can see, it becomes a, it's an earthen platform stove and uh, it's, it's, well, it's got the World Habitat Award, it's been carefully studied and, and it, it's something like uh, 70,000 years old. You can see that uh, women can do it themselves. And I just want to do just share with you this next slide, because uh, this is, uh, again, this, uh, another one of the same uh, same stoves. And on the right is our, our icon, the Chula icon, I call her. Uh, this is the, she's being, uh, she's receiving the, the uh, trophy from World Habitat, which the executive director has, David had got, and there's the president of Pakistan who, who passed it on to me, and then I pass it on to her. So this is my Chula icon. And today she earns 25 times what she used to earn five years ago, or over $750 a month as compared to $30 she earned earlier, only five years ago. So this is what the Barefoot ecosystem does. Uh, it, it can provide you with you know, wonderful returns. And I think I, I, I see many, many millionaires coming out of them. And so we do a lot of training of women, men and those with disabilities in green skills and crafts uh, carried out along, along with the handholding for six months. In 2019, 230 were trained out to which 70% rose above the poverty line within six months. And it's all by marketing all the products to each other. And then I just thought very quickly, I'll run this. This is how we provide the training and particularly to women. So these are all rural, uh, uh, rural uh, people who've been made, been made into artisans and uh, they've all learned to read drawings. It's only a three-day training program, but they are very fast at learning. And then women also learn how to use the uh, machines and, and also wherever they have to cut. You can see that these are women who are doing it. And this is the amazing thing that they are totally non-literate. They never even step out of their houses and today they are able to do this. So there's a huge potential in how we can teach everybody how to build themselves. And uh, that is uh, joined together, it's like an umbrella. And uh, when it is done, then I just want to show you this particular one, how it goes. Because everything is prefabricated and then it can be taken anyway. So, uh, and there we are. And it, all men and women, all of them learn how to do this. And this is the Now we come to tenant four, uh, which are non-engineered structures. So you can see how the present day construction um, is among the biggest environmental polluters. I just wanted to show this slide every time because it's so important for architects to understand that by carrying on as business as usual, how much, how much damage we are inflicting. So 
We use 40% of world energy, 16% of world uh, water usage, 3 billion tons of raw material, 20% of waste stream. This is your net figures. So they're pretty, you know, reliable. And then you can see the energy requirements of steel and coke and cement, and ceramic brick, and even lime. But the good quality, the good thing about lime is that it absorbs carbon from the air, so it neutralizes. But we have to we have to remember that when we design, unless we start designing in a different manner, every time we put up a building, how much damage there's going to be. And so another slide is about uh, urbanized engineered structures. This is what is normally promoted, especially by UN agencies and other uh, high level INGOs. Uh, and uh, this is really expensive urbanized models of construction that use the colonial Western charity model. That's another big problem. International organizations have destroyed initiatives of large communities by treating them as victims who must subsist on, subsist on handouts. You give them something that's so difficult to build and then you give them money and charity. And, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's just a, it's just a non-starter. And we have to see that we forget about charity completely. This is my mission today. I think people can do things themselves if we teach them, and they will be able to survive themselves. So this colonial mindset among non-state actors, such as international and national agents and aid agencies, as well as state institutions, has been extremely damaging, promoting a culture of dependence rather than encouraging self-reliance. The damage caused to the planet can be seen in the study, you see on the right, of our 100 room 100,000 one-room shelters that were built post-2010 Pakistan floods. And you can see that there was deforestation to the tune of 50, over 50,000 acres of, of forest land. And, uh, and you can see the CO2 emissions, uh, how high they are. So why do we continue be using the materials that are so damaging for us? Uh, and then I just wanted to share this very quickly with you. Uh, compared to the other one, uh, you can see that there are 40,000 shelters that were built only during these years. We have built many more, of course, since then. And this is the world's largest zero carbon footprint shelter program, even at that time. Uh, no carbon emissions, no trees were felled, 1,750 villages were covered, 300,000 persons were housed. And this is all with locally sourced materials, low energy lime and, and renewable bamboo. So uh, I just, again, she wanted to share with you how this whole thing works when we do it with a with prefabricated bamboo uh, uh, you know, panels, they are structural panels, and they can be uh, they can be fabricated very easily. You saw in the uh, training program that I showed, in which women were building these, and uh, this is something that's very flexible. It's modular, and uh, it can be expanded to make a, for instance, a schoolroom. Uh, similarly, uh, and the roofs can be also many different kinds and many different finishes, depending on what you are. The filling can also be depending on what, you know what materials are available. And then if you add on another four uh, panels, then you do what we call a, a village center or a women's center. And then we join uh, more modules together and it turns out to be um, a big village center. And I can show you uh, the next slide to show how it can be, it can work. This is actually built in, uh, it's called the Interbau Center, built at Muckley, near my zero, in, in my zero carbon campus. Uh, and uh, it's been supported actually by His Royal Highness Prince of Wales. So because he very much believes in all this and has been very, very supportive of, of the work. So just very quickly to show you, this is a, uh, same prefab panels, but they're giant ones. Uh, they're utilized to create huge marquee-like structure. It, this is 80 feet long, 57 foot wide, and 26 feet high. It's a zero carbon. It's called the Zero Carbon Cultural Center, or, or ZC3. And then uh, all trainings are carried out there. You can see the white space, and it's all people who are non-literate, who are many of them actually belong to beggar communities who are being trained here. And then you can see when we hold the international conferences there, they're all very important experts and eminent, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, professors and others from universities who are here, who are here in 2019 for this particular interval conference. And you can see the hall can double up in many ways. It's, it's all open, the air, the breeze just flows freely and it's very cool. So, uh, because I believe that, um, the level of homelessness and poverty in almost all countries is, is so high. Uh, I feel I felt that I was honor bound uh, to provide easy access to technical guidance for building safe DRR compliant structures by people themselves. So here we have more than 24 open source graphically illustrated video tutorials for green skills and zero carbon construction that have been uploaded on YouTube zero carbon channel. These step-by-step -step tutorials are enabling even non-literate households, providing them with technical guidance for self-building safe and climate resilient housing using locally sourced sustainable materials. So 
they, they, they teach you exactly how you can make the lime brick or mud brick or plaster and so on and so forth. And this is now helping uh, greatly for me to spread the message in uh, uh, many parts of Pakistan, but also now around the world. And I just wanted to show you in Milano, when they were very kind, as uh, Dr. Kishore, as you mentioned, this particular honorary degree, and, and there are the students who built this one there in, in, in Milano, and I, I, especially for me, because when I arrived there. There's a similar kind of structure that was built by rural uh, people in, in, in Pakistan. And then this one is really a, an urban log, the two of them together, and they were built by, by something like 75 students and some eminent architects uh, in this to be able to see how we could experiment. So it has many different applications and can be uh, done really everywhere, literally, wherever you can find bamboo or maybe a scrum of bamboo. And this is in a recent partnership of Heritage Foundation and British Council. It's helped to spread it to Bangladesh through live streaming of construction activity between the two countries. In the last week of May, through facilitation by British Council and Interbau, Heritage Foundation is organizing a build of log London model through tra trained Pakistani and Bangladesh female students, as well as selected UK students in London's Grand Square near King's Cross. Uh, at that time, you could come and visit the week-long event in Charing Cross, or sometime perhaps carry out a bamboo build yourselves at your own campus, and maybe just follow my my tutorials. But we are very happy to provide you guidance remotely, also, and this is what we are doing most of the time. Okay, so now I come to the last part of my my uh, presentation. I hope I'm doing all right for time. Uh, Dr. Mata, is it okay? All right. So in the last part of this presentation, I said, in deference to Louis Mumford and Jane Jacobs, I would like to touch upon the need for humanism in our cities and the present day requirement for climate resilient, ecologically driven solutions. Uh, you're probably aware that urban centers are considered the front lines of climate change battlegrounds and require urgent measures for refashioning urban environments to mitigate climate change impact. This is something so important because I see so much concrete everywhere and tar and, and the roads, my God, I mean, that's just killing. And the environment uh, is suffering constantly because of that. So here, um, I would like to, degree, uh, to disagree with billionaire Bill Gates when he says, and I don't know whether you read his book about how to avoid uh, climate uh, change disasters. And I quote, rich countries are best suited to develop innovative climate solution, unquote. Uh, and he, he says that there's this vast talent and inexhaustible resources that are available in the West to find universal solutions. Well, to many of us, this statement is extremely arrogant and dismissive of disaster resilient traditional techniques found in many countries in the global South. Through my work, I have demonstrated that traditional urbanism equals eco-urbanism. I would also like to point out that wealth and riches do not necessarily lead to solutions that are good for humankind. And you might you might like to think about it a little bit. In my experience, many a time, the opposite is true. I believe that restricted resources tend to provide the best, most sustainable results. Uh, I got a chance to build these over 40,000 units uh, with IOM was because suddenly there was donor fatigue and money was difficult to come by. And that's when they said, okay, there is some mad woman there who's using lime and let's look at it. Uh, and that's when I got a chance. When there was money enough, nobody bothered even to talk to me or think about anything that could be uh, you know, more economical. So I just like to show you this particular uh, <coughs> city, <coughs> the whole wall city plan, excuse me, artist rendering of the, of the wall city itself. And um, so it is my hope that you- Something that you said that has really struck me um, that is the essence of Basa, of barefoot social architecture, which is to walk barefoot and tread lightly on this earth. I think that's something really important for us to think about. But in some sense, it's almost antithetical to the project of architecture, which or the history of architecture, the way that we understand it of modernism, which has been one of treading rather heavily um, and sort of, you know, think of... Uh, in clearing huge pockets of land, clearing communities, um, building uh, in a way that is supposed to define this. It, it comes with as an idea of arrogance, right in itself. Um, and I wonder that yes, in perhaps communities uh, in, in Pakistan and places we're quite fortunate to still have that indigenous knowledge and resources, as you say, 
But that might not be the case everywhere. I'm thinking of Western Europe, where, you know, because of so much agriculture, so much development, there actually aren't forests that can sustain you. There just aren't the resources to build with indigenous knowledge and indigenous materials anymore. Um, so I wonder how much what you're talking about can be, how do we translate it to other communities? Or, um, you know, so just to get us started, if you could sort of reflect on that thought. Okay, so, uh, so what, uh, what I believe is that there are lots of research going on in Western uh, universities as well. And uh, they're, they're working with different kinds of materials for, for uh, I mean, even lime, for instance, is a material that can be used very effectively for, for any kind of masonry and so on. And uh, uh, there are people using, you know, all kinds of other techniques for, for creating low impact materials. And I think we need to, the only problem is it's confined to universities, not going out in the field. It's not, it's not available to architects. And I think we have to make a big push for this to see how we can use materials that will just lower the carbon footprint. Plus also in you know, the old techniques may still be there. For instance, in the UK, somebody raised this question that they do, they did have wattle and daub and that kind of construction. And there is no reason why some of it cannot actually be, be promoted. Uh, we also found that, for instance, in the UK, uh, there is somebody who's growing bamboo, not, not enough so far. But why is it the bamboo can't be grown in, in other countries? I mean, the US is, is so amazing. It's got just so many vast kind of all kinds of uh, climate and, uh, and everything. Why is it that you know, we can't promote uh, bamboo growing there? Because in Southeast Asia, bamboo is abundant. And even in Pakistan, it's been used, but nobody ever took it seriously. So I think we have to be looking at all the materials very carefully now to see which can be used, which will lower the carbon footprint. It doesn't matter what it is, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah thank that you. Answer your question. Yes, that Ishwar. does, that does. Um, are there, I, I mean, Martin, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I, I actually, um, I have a question and then mm -hmm. I, I yeah, will sure. recognize my colleague, uh, Catherine Siva. I'm very interested in the way in which um, your work, Mrs. Larry, is dedicated to and addressed at empowering women. And I wonder what happens in traditional families in Pakistan when women learn to build? How are the traditional gender relations, which we know are rooted in patriarchy, how are they disrupted? And how is that, what, what kind of liberatory potential is there in empowering women to build? Yeah. You know, it's always been a, a question that we've been debating because uh, everybody thought that if we were to reach out to women, then men will get disturbed and then they will never allow it. But funnily enough, you know, because I started on working with women uh, after the earthquake in 2005. And because I was a woman, I could go into all their places. And nobody else could, no man could enter those houses, but I could. And I found that they were desperate. Um, I mean, they were... Uh, they lost so much. They lost some of them had lost children, their dear ones. They were living in, in these, um, uh, you know, totally derelict places, uh, hardly surviving, and the cold weather was there, and nobody was even talking to them. And then I, I held this particular uh, meeting. I wanted to have a chat with them, and the general who was in charge said, "You are, you, you know, what are you trying to do, madam? Uh, you don't you realize that nobody will come because women are not allowed to be out of the house." I said, "Well, okay, I'm going to give it a shot," and you won't believe that something like a couple of hundred women walked up something like two or three hours to get to the place where I was holding this meeting, and it was nothing but an open orchard where we were because there was no buildings. And I said, what did you do before? I mean, and so on. And they, they came out with the crafts that they'd been practicing. And I said, why is it that you don't take it up again? And so we worked out a whole thing about how they could start making their beautiful beadwork. And it, we made sure that it began to sell. And you won't believe that men then joined hands, whether it was husbands or fathers or whatever. And they began to, because in the market only they could go. go. And they brought the beads also. So, I mean, the whole thing just changed completely. So there are societies in Pakistan, they are very conservative areas, but I think there's a way to break that. And I think we have to get women out in front and when they do, then men do accept it one way or the other. And I think the whole thing is if you empower them, especially if they can start earning money and men can join in in that as well, then they are not threatened. Great, thank you. So, Catherine. I mean, I'm you. Good time I've seen that it's okay. So let's hear from Professor Sifat Nordenson, our Director of Landscape Architecture. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mrs. Lari, for this presentation. I want to just say I'm fascinated by something that you put forth as part of the principles 
uh, about uh, of thinking about the relationship of social and an ecological or environmental justices together. I appreciate that so much. It rings true with our own mission of the landscape program and here at the Spitzer School as well. But one thing that I've been grappling with in my own work and research is thinking about the uh, oft uh, conflict that arises between social and environmental justice issues. They are not always aligned and often at odds. And I often see this play out in the domain of housing. So I'm curious, how do you see, and maybe an example is often when building housing, you're exploiting a landscape. And so how does one remain true to both the idea of preserving and conserving landscapes uh, while serving human uh, rights such as that for housing. And I'm curious if there have been any kind of conflicts of this sort that you've seen in your own work. Yeah, well, of course, you know, the, the, I think the issue is, and you are absolutely right, there are these conflicts because the way we build uh, normal buildings, uh, conventional buildings, uh, you, you cannot really achieve the kind of eco justice that one is talking about. Uh, and social housing, of course, is, is being done all over, all over the world, basically. But it's not necessarily uh, aligned with the objectives of, of ecological justice, because the materials we are using are not necessarily the ones that will provide that. So my whole thing would be, and I've been very lucky, I've, there's no doubt about it, that I've hit upon the solution uh, with the materials that were available to me uh, in my in my in the countryside, not in the in the cities, but in the countryside, and I found that I could the, the two could align. So I think here there too you will have to struggle a lot, but also I think you have to totally ruin this, uh, you know, for landscape. So if somehow you can create more. Uh, uh, more greenery and uh, more like Miyawaki forest, the ones that I have used, because that means a whole dense lot of trees that can grow very quickly. I was so surprised, and I was recently in Oxford, and I found they've uh, now because of COVID, so many roads are closed and they're all pedestrianizing everything. Even in the US, I found this, but there's no kind of no trees, like no, no forests within cities, because either they are confined to a, you know a park or something, but nothing within the landscape and I found and I couldn't unfortunately I couldn't show my my echo enclave that I've created where because of the forest I've got four forests with 600 trees Miyawaki style which are very dense and the air has become absolutely clean so there are I think methodologies now and there's a lot of work going on in many parts of the, of the world where people are struggling to find the right solution but I think every context has to be taken up with the challenges that it presents and then to see what you can do with it. I'm sorry, I'm not, not sure that I managed to answer your question, but I think we just need to work harder at all this. That was great, thank you. Okay. Yes. So my question is regarding materials. So I know that um, indigenous materials or uh, more regional materials can provide more sustainable, resilient options, but how do you um, change the um, people's like willingness to use them? Because we're kind of, kind of used to like using the traditional steel, concrete, glass, so I'm interested in how you how you would think to change that uh, the perspective on using different materials. Yeah, you brought in a very sore topic uh, to the to the table today because <laughs> most of the time uh, the impression is that uh, people who are living in villages or who are affected by disasters want pakka, which is really concrete and other kind of structures which are more urbanized. And this is exactly uh, what I was told by these international agencies who had actually taken this wrong kind of model to the, to the villages, uh, uh, giving them something that was really totally inappropriate and, and, and giving them a model which I don't think really worked. And so I was told that they want that kind of thing. But when I went out, I went to the, when I had started to work, I saw that I could do uh, sustainable buildings uh, but the thing was, they had to believe that they will survive. For instance, earth or mud is uh, highly denigrated because it crumbles when it, it rains, it, it, it disintegrates. But you know, the moment I, we use lime with it, it becomes such, you know, such a strong kind of, uh, of material. And uh, uh, with bamboo also, nobody believed that bamboo was any use. So my trick was that the first house we got built of mud and, and bamboo, the roof was bamboo and the walls are, uh, the masonry is mud. Uh, mud brick, uh, sunrise brick. And I said, why don't you climb over it? So 10, 15 people climbed over the house. And then that was, we won the game because that is what 
you know, assured them that it was perfectly safe and perfectly okay. So you have to do a little bit of drama, I think, in, in all this to be able to convince people. But there are ways, I think, to find the right solution and to, to somehow, you know, see that people accept it. Uh, it's, it's hard. It's not easy. It's hard. But I think it can be done and must be done. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mrs. Larry, for sharing very interesting topic. And I just want uh, to get your view uh, on the key messages. What is your key messages in the framework of green building design for the poor? I think my key message is that we should bypass all governments. We bypass every state or organ because they are not interested in going to the poor. We go straight to the poor and you know, empower them, train them, get them to understand they can do it themselves. And that's the only way we'll get to the poor because I have not seen any government in, in, you know, in uh, this part of the world who are interested in, in solving this problem. And in the West also you have homelessness. I see people under bridges Well, nobody seems to be doing much about it. So the, I think the trick is to find the places where we can settle them and then just empower them to build themselves. Uh, and that is, I, I believe that that's where we will be able to get to a, a huge number of people who are shelterless today. And we must do it. I don't know what the condition is in Myanmar, but I think there may be a lot of people who might need that kind of help as well. So uh, I think the technology is there. We should use technology. And my effort now is to see that I can get loans for these people directly rather than through non-government non organizations, which is the normal standard practice. I think if we can train even women to be able to work as we're doing and get them the funding that's needed, they will be able to return the money and they will be able to do it themselves. Uh, and this is my hope and we are getting there. And I've just got some good news. And hopefully if I can convince more banks, this will happen. Yeah. yeah. I think the idea is of, uh, of, of empowering people um, and also helping them. Um, uh, Ali, uh, I don't know how many more questions you want to take, Marta, but uh, Ali, would you like to ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Very refreshing work. Uh, I, I was wondering if you see any relationships between your work and maybe things that um, I, I re it reminded me of, uh, which is the work of uh, Arundhati Roy on NGOization. Um, I think we live in a world that a lot of things that we have to resist are not uh, forces that are denying us things, but forces that are promising us things. Uh, NGOs being similar to, for example, missionaries that come with a benevolent face, but they actually are, as you mentioned, colonial forces. So I wonder in your experience or, or your work, um, if you've found ways to, to resist them, uh, not only creating alternatives for them, but also finding ways to, to make maybe communities um, aware and alert and conscious of, of the difference between yeah. two things. Yeah. So uh, Ali, where are, you, where are you based, if I may ask? Where are you based, Ali? Uh, I'm from Iran, but uh, I, I am in City College. Um, <laughs> Ali, well, um, the thing is, I think there are lots of similarity between Iran and, and Pakistan, actually speaking. And I think uh, what we have to resist definitely is the, the what I call the, the, you know, the charity model, which is the Western colonial charity model, which believes uh, in, in the goodness of their heart. I mean, one must not question uh, why they're doing it, because it is something that they do want to do uh, to help. But I think the whole strategy is not the right one because it doesn't go very far. And so in the last five years, I have not accepted any funding from any, uh, any international organization, except if, if it is for training of, of people. And that's all I do now is to see that we, start, we provide training to all these people so that they're able to do it themselves. And we don't give them any charity whatsoever. It's always co-building. It's always a partnership. It's been hard work because uh, in Pakistan since 2005, we've had a lot of money coming in. I cannot tell you the amount of funding that arrived at our doorstep. And I cannot tell you how misuse, how it's been misused also. Because I feel that the money that comes in is really propping up our highly corrupt governments. And somehow we have to make sure that the money, whatever happens, it should go to the people and not to, not to governments or to 
coffers of people who normally take it. So uh, I, I'd like to get to people directly. And I think people are ready and they would want to do it because they want a better quality of life. And we have to just get on with that, right? Yeah. And you have fantastic earth. And I mean, the amount of, I mean, Iran has this amazing tradition of craft. You know, it's incredible. You can use it all. Of something, huh? Right. I just w just would add to that. I, I agree with you so much, Mrs. Larry, and and I and I know you have great suspicion of using bricks to build because of the environmental damage that they cause. But there is great great research that one of my colleagues, Brian Goldstein, has made with regard to the Black Power movement, and he published in New York, particularly in Harlem, he published a wonderful essay called "The Brother with a Brick," which is about training self, you know, training training African American working class African Americans to build uh, and take charge of their of their economic and spatial and political future. So there are so many resonances uh, across across our across um, across our countries, across our continents, and across okay. our problems. So and also because there was not enough time, I did not mention people like John Turner and so on, because actually I, I would I thought tomorrow I'll mention him. And, and Ivan Illich and so on and so forth, who've done so much work earlier on, you know, 50 years ago, when they were talking about how you can build together and self-building and so on. And they were also a little bit before their time, but I think there are lots of things that we can learn from those strategies that they developed and to apply them today, there's no need for us to just, you know, devise our own ways. I mean, we have to innovate, of course, we have to, you know, find solutions ourselves, but there's much that has been done before. There's lots of thought processes that have gone there before us. There's no reason for us to not take them on. But the whole thing, I think the issue with me always is how do you scale up? So you can do a few, but you have to scale up. You have to make sure that everybody gets it. I mean, I, today there, there are millions of, of, uh, of households that are shelterless. I need to get to them. And that's why I need technology. I need ways that I can train everybody remotely, not to not even go there. So that's where I need now a lot of help as to how I can get it going in that way. And I I'll think it's talk possible. About it. <laughs> so we'll how, take, about one last, how about one last question, Marta? Um, from Judy. Me too, right. Yeah, Judy, and then I think we will, because we have been here for a long time and there's another event happening in the morning. This is Larry, it's getting late in Karachi. <laughs> but Judy, you have the floor. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for coming here. I just wanted to ask you, as a student who is about to graduate architecture, I was wondering, and who is interested, you know, to the same cause, you know, architecture for the poor. Um, I was wondering what recommendation or what advice you can give us. Um, what are the first steps that one has, you know, needs to have to make uh, in order to actually create that type of architecture for the poor? Yeah. So, so Judy, are you a student? Which which year are you in? Which, where are you now? Which, which uh, year? I'm a fifth year architecture school in bachelor's okay. here in Spitzer. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry that I could not finish my my presentation because in the end I am talking about this because you know I'm talking to a lot of young people now where everywhere I go these are really my audience I have to tell you this so they're the ones with whom would I say resonates and I find now uh, honor bound to see if I can find a solution in some way so wherever I'm going I'm asking whether it's the professional institutes or whether it's universities to say maybe we should start a program of incubators or social good of some kind, where we, we provide space and what we call, um, you know, there's something called um, uh, social, cultural, uh, ecological impact investment, which is available, can be directed towards this to us, but we've not found one for, for architecture. We should do that because being used in many other ways. And if these institutions or universities or even uh, architects who are well known who have got established practices were to create these incubators where you provide some investment, you provide space, you also provide some hand holding. There is no reason why young people cannot actually get into this field. I think the, the, the way has to be we have to help you, young people, to be able to do this. You cannot do it on your own. You, you, you really, I mean, things are very tough for you. So, but we have to find ways to be able to help you. And let me see, I'm trying hard. Let me see who might listen to me and where we might be able to do it. But I do know that all of you and many of you really want a different direction in architecture. I know that. 
and we have to help you to do that in some way.